typically how I begin my lectures. Well, not necessarily in the dark. The lighting's not, never that great. But anyway, so this is the NCAT uh, Harvesting Clean Energy 2015 breakout session. I gave a, a talk yesterday, which is already up on YouTube. And so this is more or less a follow-up panel to my talk, which was more or less looking at the trajectories of energy flows through societies and civilizations. So I think we're you know, in a room here with maybe a dozen or so people, and I was just going to open it up for, for questions, or I can just kind of keep blabbing on about my degree program. I'm happy to do that, too. So um, any, any questions anybody wants to start with? Started to go a little bit into some of the uh, some of the projects you're doing around Montana. Oh sure. Uh, if you can maybe just oh, some more detail. Yeah, that that, that, that sounds great, Carl. Yeah, th thanks for that. <laughs> so, um, re recently, I just uh, passed my professional engineering exam. So I'm a licensed professional engineer in, in the state of Montana. I think that's really opened a lot of a lot of doors. And um, what I what I can do is just sort of dig into some of that. Um, so here's uh, kind of my professional engineering file, and e each one of these uh, little folders represents a, a a project of some type or another. Some have been false starts. Some some are um, currently uh, in in the works. Uh, this this little one right here. This is uh, Bobo Kant, uh, Bobo Electric there in Missoula. Um, I've just been doing some structural engineering work for him. He's you know he'll, he'll put PV. On a uh, on a building, and it's you know it's it's relatively uh, straightforward, not too nothing too crazy. But with my professional engineering stamp, which you can see here, I'll um, go in, uh, take a few photographs of the building. Um, if there's some structural defects, I'll make sure that he amends those before he goes in and installs the panel. Um, I've gotten myself in a little bit of trouble sometimes. I'll, I'll look and say, gosh, you've got some insulation problems. You should probably address those. He's like, well, no, that's not what I'm paying you to do. Just look at the structure and let the homeowner worry about those too. Um, so, you know, relatively modest uh, bill billing fee, and that's just kind of what the going rate is for professional engineers in Montana. Um, this is another little little project that's been going on for quite some time. We, we finally got... Uh, a, a permit to install a webcam on Brennan's Wave. I'm not sure if you've, if you've seen this, but it's uh, right, right downtown. There were uh, a couple community leaders who, unfortunately, I'm not really seeing my, um, my, my photos, but to install a, a webcam. And a challenge we faced, we proposed that we put solar panels out on the bow of this observation deck. And for reasons I'm still not really clear about, the city said, no, we don't want any PV on, on the, the deck. So we're now faced with a $20,000 estimate to bring um, electricity maybe 100 feet from the, from the um, uh, restroom nearby. And um, fortunately, my another one of my students who has a company called um, well, my, my, he's got one company called My Solar Chest, and he just came up with a, and unfortunately I don't have a, I don't have a picture of it, but he's built a um, golf cart with three solar panels on top and sort of a souped-up battery pack in. He can do 12 volt or 120 from it, and the idea is rather than uh, disobey the city and put a permanent PV panel out there, we allow the, the surfers to drive their surfboards over the wave, park the solar cart, and then plug the camera in while they're using it. So we're, and he's um, cut the price in half, more or less, of, of the grid tie. So that's that's another one. Um, chemistry, climate change, coaster. Um, Missoula is lucky enough to have one, like really the world's leader in pedicab manufacturing. So I don't know if you've heard, you know, seen the pedicab. We've got one person pedaling up front. Uh, it's typically in, a, in an urban setting, late at night. Someone wasn't doesn't want to get a DUI, etc. Um, they're having problems now with some of the pedicabs that they've deployed in um, New Orleans on the cobblestone street. These things tend to rattle themselves apart. So I've been uh, providing a little bit of engineering expertise for that. So sustainable transportation, if, if you will. Um, 
that's that's coaster. I don't have any figures to go along with it. This is probably one of the bigger projects that I that I currently have. So um, Craig Thomas has his own little company called Skyber Enterprises. Um, he has partnered with Mike Holacek of Algae Aquatech, who's who's here right now. Um, their their green powerhouse is purported to be you know one of the only carbon negative electricity and, and heat production facilities um, yet to come out. We are, are yet to be funded on this, uh, but I was approached originally by Steve Corrick, who is the son of Ernie Corrick. I don't know if you remember the old um, um, Champion International days in Missoula, but the big lumber mills. And so uh, Steve suggested that Craig and I team up. So we've written a, a series of proposals, and I can show you a couple of them. Let me just um, bring up a new screen here. Documents, conference courses, grants. And I just um, I just shared this yesterday with Lillian Salerno and she was quite optimistic with about it. Um, un unfortunately <laughs> thanks for the soundtrack. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. That's it happens in class all the time. Girl, so I'm to me and I is, is that is that his uh, specific ring dial? So. <laughs> um, so what I can and I, I've um, unfortunately when we went to submit this uh, this this past summer we were we were on Montana time. We submitted it at 3.15 p.m. It was due at 5.15 East Coast time, so we're, we're going to have to wait for the next round of funding, but um, I'm, not, um, I'm not ashamed to uh, show it here. Actually, that's the, that's, the, um, that's the LOI. This is the actual um, uh, first page. So, Craig Thomas is a specialist in uh, large-scale biomass, so he's a, he's, a, he's a forester and has, has built a lot of his own um, timber harvesting equipment. He's been cited in a lot of uh, pretty prominent magazines for sustainability practices. He's, he's done a lot of logging, actually saved some of Teddy Roosevelt's original structures from, from fire where his forest treatments have been applied. Um, elk populations come back and, and fire is mitigated. So. And, and again, what we're really trying to do here is sort of turn Montana problems, like forest fires, into Montana solutions by utilizing the biomass that otherwise would just be, uh, you know, burned up. So I'll just let you read through that. Um, this, this deal right here, selling grid scale power at a rate competitive with coal, is an issue. Uh, coal is selling it at like $15 a ton. Uh, it takes um, foresters, if, if done properly, more on the order of $100 per ton to get wood out of the forest, and that's uh, you know it's before it's been dried, et cetera. Um, patent pending biofilter, I can show you that as well. Um, and then using um, some of the byproducts, tars and biochars, and you've probably seen a lot of the biochar. Um, floating around. Craig just dropped a uh, packet of biochar off on my desk last week and we're now working with the chemistry department to analyze that for you know mainly organic content and make sure we don't have uh, heavy metals in, in that as well. Um, as I mentioned, beetle kill, they, they would also love to scale their technology up to take care of some of these asbestos problems. And I did not realize what an issue asbestos is, but once it sort of gets in the air, um, you know, the, the trees, of course, are our natural filters, and all that um, pine and sap captures the asbestos. It's sort of s sitting there stuck, and so the next time that burns, all the asbestos is sort of re-emitted. So how do you uh, build a, <laughs> build a uh, right, how, you know, how, how, do you, how do you contain that? So that, that's, um, but, uh, and then, and then the, the big upshot, and, and I think when we were hearing some of the previous speakers today, we saw that, um, you know, what is the, the, the value, you know, how do you um, quantify wealth? And, you know, for a lot of people, it's, it's, it's open range, it's hunting, it's fishing, it's clear skies, and so that's what that final uh, number six uh, addresses. Um, so, like I said, we've been, we've been pursuing this for quite some time. This is Craig's prototype. This is his house, this is his shop, this is his cabin. 
Um, this is the little prototype. So this is just a conventional wood-fired boiler. He uses to heat all three of the structures. The heat is pumped underground. And it was partially um, inspired by his wife who said, you know, gosh, Craig, I love it when it's nice and warm in the house, but why the heck is it smoky every time the heat comes on? So <laughs> he and, and Holacek came up with a, um, this, this filter, which is here, and I can show you some of the details, but they basically are um, rerouting the flue gas through their filter and really doing an impressive job taking almost all the particulates out, a lot of the NOx, the SOx, um, the COs, and the CO2s as well. And so that's, that's uh, we're you know, currently looking for funding to scale that up you know, to the institutional scale and perhaps even to the, the grid scale if, if possible. Here's the grid scale. So this is a shot of you know, looking, at, looking at coal strip and his um, idea. I've got a, a video. If we have time later, I might, if, if somebody wants to see it, I can show you a video. It's a really impressive animation of what this thing would actually look like. It's close to rail. Each one of these little green containers that you see here is more or less a uh, larger version of the, the filter, which is just a home-built home version there, the uh, piece number two. There's Craig. If you get a chance, read his book. It's great. Uh, a little bit irreverent, but uh, fun, entertaining to read. And then um, here's some of the um, environmental data that they have from their preliminary testing. So obviously there's heat recovery going on here rather than, so otherwise all this heat would have just been exhausted to the atmosphere, but through their process they're able to re recapture even, even more than they otherwise would have. Oxygen um, goes up. Each of these numbers I've just normalized to whatever the, um, the, the control value would have been. So CO2 is reduced, um, CO2, PPM, and then I think somewhere down here, maybe not in this particular submission, I've got um, the data on um, particulates too. So here's a more um, complete view. Uh, so this really is an integrative system. If you've seen some of the complexity in the algae aquatech, there are multiple sta uh, stages. You've got gasifiers, drivers, uh, that's an electricity generator making its own heat, uh, and you can think of this as sort of a distributed heat model that would be sent to a pond. I was just talking with a gentleman earlier today who's, you know, they're doing aquaponics. Uh, so sort of re recreating that, uh, you know, capturing all the gas and, and uh, utilizing it. Um, the, the BFRs that you see here in brown are the biofilter reactors. That is that sort of belly there that all the, the emissions are going through. So um, it, it's sort of at the at the heart, if you will, of a lot of these processes. Um, food is integrated as well. Uh, food waste into a digester at, at a school-sized uh, institution. If I understand correctly, um, seven states are going to outlaw uh, grocery stores and restaurants from putting uh, food in the landfill by, by next year. So I, I think, hopefully, we're getting a little bit ahead of that curve as well. Again, there's the shot. Here's kind of inside the, the filter itself. This, this thing is actually inoculated, so there are microorganisms uh, metabolizing a lot of the waste gases inside. What's the source of inoculum? Um, you know, I, Mike Holacek could, could answer that better than I can. He's, he's more the uh, biochemistry specialist, so I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the, the, the names of the microorganisms at the top of my head. But, uh, it's like, where would you get them? Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to say just from, from natural soils, I mean, that these are, um, you know, not necessarily photosynthetic organisms, and it, it might be in here somewhere, but they would be, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't know all, all the details. Um, but, you know, just like any um, microbiology, it's sort of self-perpetuating. It, you know, it's a living system, so as long as the uh, growing conditions are right, they, they sort of uh, multiply themselves until they reach the, their own little... Malthusian limit within their system, if you will. Um, so some of the environmental testing again. Uh, this is the uh, Teddy Roosevelt cabin that I was mentioning previously that Craig uh, um, saved from burning. This is his own uh, his own um, technology that he's developed for sustainable harvesting of timber.
This is a, a greenhouse, and in fact, tomorrow our 25 kilowatt Biomax downdraft gasifier is moving from Missoula down to Corvallis to partner with Brian Jackson of Bitterroot Valley Green. So this is a 50,000 square foot facility, you know, right there nestled in the mountains. Uh, he got the thing up and running. In fact, uh, during the governor's um, innovation awards, he pulled right up to um, the top hat and brought them some of his, his produce. So he's, he's off and running. And what we're going to try to do with our uh, 25 kilowatt Biomax gasifier is provide CO2, heat, and electricity for this facility with uh, stuff that otherwise would just be, you know, slash pile burn more or less. So again, taking that Montana problem and turning it into a, a solution. And he's a real go-getter. If you get a chance, uh, you should definitely check out Brian Jackson. That slash pile source is from you know, the service gathering that Right, yeah, so a lot of times it's more economical or just to um, burn the slash in, in the woods, but if you can sort of look at, you know, a system like this and say, you know, let's go ahead and take that, um, you know, pay a marginal value, whatever the transport cost would be to get that out of the woods, uh, and again, just turn it into heat, electricity, and, and, and CO2 for the greenhouse, then, uh, yeah, rather than just letting it go to waste and pumping it into the atmosphere, uh, use it in, in a system like this, right, with, with the slash pile burns. Or even, um, and it's, it's funny, I, I just, was just at the Clean Coal Conference here in Billings uh, a couple months ago and, and talking with uh, one of the deputy secretaries of fossil fuels, and he's like, well, why don't you guys just go in and, and cut all your fire breaks now, before the fire starts, and then when the fire starts, you can use the <laughs> use those fire breaks to put out a small patch of forest rather than just let, I'm like, hmm, maybe <laughs> fossil fuel guys. And so I, I don't know how that would go over, you know, having sort of a checkerboard looking forest in Montana, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I'm pretty used to flying over the Midwest, and that the entire Midwest looks like a giant quilt pattern. So maybe, maybe there's something there. I mean, maybe you do go in and build in these um, preventative fire breaks now, and then, you, you know, you, you spot the, the forest fire by satellite, and that, that break gives you some time to put the thing out before you get, uh, you know, barbecued elk and uh, burnt soil. So, I don't know, that just kind of big, again, kind of just big big picture thinking. Um, I showed that already. So this is sort of the containerized system that Craig has developed, um, and you can imagine these same green containers providing the filtration system that I was showing here on the the coal-fired power plant. So, who knows? I, you know, it, it's it's kind of one of those things where, and and um, maybe something like this would be an interesting sort of twilight technology, if you will, to try out at Coal Strip before it goes down. Like, okay, the thing's going to get shut down, decommission in the next couple of years. Could we put a pilot study in there and and just see if it might work? Um, if it, if it works here in Coal Strip, maybe we export this technology to China, who you know, still has a, a long horizon on their uh, coal combustion processes. So we, we've really tried to be integrative with this. Yes? Is there viably such a thing as clean coal? It? Well, it's a, yeah, it's a great question whether or not there's such such thing as clean coal. And I was very intrigued by that same question when I went to the, the Montana Asia meeting here last month when uh, Chris Smith signed a uh, agreement or a treaty or, or what have you between the United States and, and China, a lot of the clean coal people had the same question. They were, they were, they were a little bit, um, you know, kind of jaded, like, gosh, I've heard all this stuff before. I don't know if anything's going to come out of it. There, there were a couple companies there that seemed to be a little more amped up than some of the others in terms of this... Um, new acronym that's flying around called CCUS, so it's Carbon Capture Utilization and Sequestration. So the, um, so the, the, the capture, I mean this obviously would be an example of, of capturing, so you're taking the CO2 and, and uh, you know, putting it through a filter. Um, utilization might be something like with a brewery, for example. I know a lot of the bigger breweries will capture a lot of the CO2 coming off. It's still food grade CO2. They'll put that back 
into their um, processes. I just learned this also a month ago, but there's a 200 long CO2 pipeline between uh, Wyoming and Montana. So CO2 is being pumped out of the coal industry in Wyoming and then pumped underground for enhanced oil recovery. So you might say, well, is that clean or not? Well, the CO2 is going underground. Um, for better or worse, it's being used to pump more hydrocarbons up out of the earth. So long answer to your question, is, is it clean, is it dirty? I, you know, it, it's, um, in, a, in a lot of times, I, I think what I found in my own experiences with the renewable energy technologies, it's a little bit pick your poison. You know, there's, there's always going to be some downside to any technology, no matter what it is. So I'm not dodging the question, but I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer to that either. Do you know relative BTU inputs versus outputs? Of? What it takes to... Oh, that, that's a fantastic question, too. There's a, there's a paper, and I don't, I don't have the numbers exactly off the top of my head, but there was a paper that came out not too long ago about um, the reduced efficiency, if you will. So if you're putting additional energy into compressing gases and filtration, et cetera, uh, of course, on a, on a Carnot basis, on a, you know, a strictly thermodynamic basis, the efficiency does go down, um, you know, because you, you are expending additional energy. So, uh, of, of course, and absolutely, and it, you know, and depending on how the engineering goes, it might be, um, you know, a two to three percent uh, reduction in, in efficiency. So, and it's, it varies and it's, it's evolving, but uh, yeah, something to think about. Yeah. Question in the back? Oh, yeah. I was wondering if you thought that clean coal um, as a possible solution was actually something that was catching, or if it's just one of the many um, kind of far out, non feasible ideas in the suit. Um, yeah. And also, when it comes to carbon sequestration, um, if you remember that individual speaking about like the scale, how, how scalable that would be to reuse carbon um, considering the amount of carbon. So, um, what, what specific uh, question? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 do, so, give me the first one first. Um, the first one was whether you thought, I guess, based on your exposure to the conversation, um, if clean coal was something that was catching. Oh, I um, see. Or whether it was just like part of the suit, just like one right. of the many. Well, so yes. Yeah, so, right. So one of, one of the more promising technology I think that I saw at this at this clean coal conference in Billings was was. Um, basically pumping that CO2 into an algae pond, you know, where you actually do have microorganisms that have either, you know, evolved over time or in some cases might be engineered to take up the, the CO2 and actually metabolize it, take it from a, you know, basically do a phase change with it, take it from a gaseous form into a living form, whether, you know, liquid, uh, protoplasm, what have you. So, I mean, that I think that is, that is one. There's no one version of clean coal, really, but that to me, seems like you know one of the more promising. And then, sorry, what was the second question? Um, the second question was whether um, it seems scalable. Oh. And I guess like with the like if you can have like cell interactions with um, algae and their um, growth interfaces and um, and like how you would actually extract oil from algae production, then maybe it could be scalable because then you can say, oh, like one coal plant and several like algae-growing um, facilities or labs. So, like, is it scalable, I guess, Right, right. So yeah. It seem like sure. People felt you could be? Sure. Well, that's a great question. So you take, um, what is it, 40 billion metric tons of carbon that our technologies emit per year. And I have, I, I'm not sure I'm up to it. Frequently in lecture, I'll sit down and just sort of do a back of the envelope calculation, and I could sort of tell you how many acres of algae you would need to do that. And um, maybe in a, in a subsequent lecture, I will do that in my 102 course. It's something I've been meaning to do for quite some time. And, and but you know, if you look at the sort of the scale of this particular facility, I guess while we're while we're on the topic, I mean, this is actually one of the projects that I've been dumping the majority of my energy into, and I can show you another um, version of it. Let me just pop in here, 2015. I think we ran out to um, MVRCT and made a little, uh, here we go. I'll, 
turn the volume up on my computer. Hopefully you can hear this. Welcome to Skyville Enterprises. The long-term goal of this project is to clean up coal-fired power plants by scrubbing through gas as woody, woody biomass harvested from harvest low-value low forest and timber, timber residents. I'll, I'll show you the scale that we're taking our coal to replace coal to replace entirely woody, woody biomass. 20 loads of coal could be replaced now with 30 loads of wood. The economics become more competitive when combustion byproducts are sold agriculturally when carbon trading models are applied. What you see before you is a larger version of biofuel reactor, which you've already seen the proposal, and which we hope to commercialize to help MDRCT. The first two takes for areas to the states to condense and collect blue gas moisture and reduce blue gas temperature to approximately 110 degrees. You know, this would be a multi-million dollar project. The second two tanks are for liquid handling. And these, and these tanks, tanks with condensed, condensed water, water and byproduct combustion, combustion is used, used to maintain appropriate moisture, moisture content, content in the biofilm bio media. So the, the biofilm bio itself is, is actually uh, the biofilm bio media stay, that has become saturated with effluent can, can itself become, become a feedstock fuel. fuel. I've shared this a little bit with uh, Max Baucus too, and I, I shared it with Pipe High School directs, directs the exhaust cast, cast to the primary BFR array, array which can expand, expand to varying degrees depending, depending, depending on, the on the size of the power plant, plant it serves. Here's, your, here's, here's my favorite part of the video. <laughs> there, there's your uh, scalability. <laughs> Infinite configurations, well, I don't know. As individual, individual units become, become saturated, saturated, they are, they are moved, moved to the drying drying array, array, where additional cooling and distribution This, cooling this cooling also becomes, potentially becomes potentially somewhat of a self-perpetuating cycle as well, just like the, the, dry dry saturated the saturated array, array actually becomes a reutilized feedstock for more energy in a similar way. First of half of the materials used for electricity production and the remaining carbon is used to manufacture byproducts such as char char charcoal. In the second, second mode, 100% of the heat is extracted, extracted and this best as laid materials become vitrified. So you could control it so some of it could go back into soil and, and then the some stuff goes into, into energy production. Blue gases, gases are again filtered. Filter. Transportation methods to and from the plant include both rail and truck with existing infrastructure. Doesn't that look fun to build? <laughs> so, anyway, we've been talking a little bit about transport the transport agricultural byproducts regionally, nationally, and eventually internationally. So you know, the idea would be to integrate with existing agricultural networks and mining wheat networks to maximize the economic system. system. In fact, several, several agricultural byproducts are critical components of the biofiltral media. Our containerized system also serves as a soil transportation system for minerals such as bentonite, another media component. So bentonite is another uh, mineral that's used in the, in the media. Thank you again for your time and leadership. I look forward to working with you as the project progresses yes. in Montana and internationally. Mm -hmm. But you said some of it might go back into energy sure. production. What does that look like? Well, it, just right. Well, it's um, it's weird. I mean, we're 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 sort of on an energy treadmill. So as long as we're using thermal plants to create energy, then yeah, that's that that is where it goes. But I mean, that's just that's and, and then you kind of you again you kind of pick your poison. Do you do you select a finite non-renewable thermal source like really old trees, or do you select a um, renewable here and now thermal resource like trees that are not that old? <laughs> yes, question. Yeah. Yeah. So I I did not have the benefit of hearing your talk yesterday, but I 
Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to enter fresh. Sure. Um, and I'm wondering if you can give like a two minute big picture about how you got here and oh. the vision for this kind of, I think, along the lines of that question, um, but kind of like what problem the system was designed to address and like the Solution. Right, right, yeah. So my 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 big picture, and the and the one the one slide that I spent a lot of time on um, yesterday, and I will dip into that briefly because it, it touches a lot on, on the question that, that was just asked, like what you know, where's the big sustainability here, and then I'll also um, just remind me, I'll, I'll hop back in. I'm I'm only up to the letter C in terms of the projects I'm working on at the moment, but I will I will hop back into those. There's there's a couple others that I want to mention. So let me. Um, let me let me dip into uh, my paper notes here. And I, I have the the good fortune that Steve Corrick there in um, Washington DC typically feeds me these things. So this I, I spent a lot of time talking about this, this paper yesterday. Um, and it's, it's similar, on a, on a, it's very similar to the 2008 paper that I wrote in terms of, you know, what are we doing going after this oil? Why, you know, why is it so valuable? What's, what's the big deal about this um, ancient sequestered carbon? Um, these researchers sort of ask the same question and show here that more or less humankind is a, is a drain on the Earth's energy resources, both renewable and non-renewable and dives into this graph I didn't spend a whole heck of a lot of time talking about it I think I showed it briefly but this um, 2000 you know 2000 plus you know 25,000 40 something uh, zeta joules is, is more or less the, the entire budget of the planet's carbon reserves that 2000 Zeta joules is the non-recoverable. That would be like even a more aggressive tar sands project. It would be like if you went down to Miami and tried to dig all the little scraps of carbon out of the sand on the beach and burn that too. So that 2,000 uh, Zeta joules is, is, is there, but not anywhere near practically recoverable in, term, in terms of combustion. The, um, the 500 is, is nuclear power, but again, non-renewable. I mean, all of those, um, all of that nuclear energy was sort of put there by the last um, supernova that created the solar system, and it's, that happened once. <laughs> We're not going to wait around for that to happen again. And the, um, the 40, that's the re recoverable uh, fossil fuels that are left. So I will do just a little bit of math on that. So that's what these guys have done. So let me just pop into this. So if we look at that um, so let, let's just let's just say the total and this is going to be in joules um, equals and what I say uh, 40 uh, e 21 so zeta is e, uh, 10 to the 21st and then if we look at the earth's it's like global civilization's annual en energy budget that's 500 exajoules so um, annual budget, um, I hope these numbers work out. I'm doing this on the fly, so sometimes this flops too. So um, equals 500 E18. Um, so now if, if you look at you know, the, the total recoverable carbon stores on the planet, you look at and just assume that all of our energy comes from non-renewables, you look at um, uh, years to, to omega, and let's just go ahead and turn that guy into a symbol. Um, years to omega, you just divide the two numbers by each other, equals that number, uh, divided by this number. This is of course on a linear basis, assuming it's, it's constant. Um, it's only 80 years. <laughs> it, it's, um, and if, um, and of course, we don't use only um, carbon for our, you know, re renewables are coming online. Let me, let me make sure I got that right. So 40 
Yeah, 4 times 10 to the 21, right, because we were at 40 zeta joules, uh, 500 exajoules. For some reason, I'm, I'm concerned I might be off by one order of magnitude. Let me, let me show you why. Um, I did spend a lot of time looking at this graph, showing this is the total amount of energy stored in our, in our uh, biomass. Um, this is a, should be a very troubling curve to most of us. This one, too, is um, showing that um, 2,000 years ago, at our at then rate of consumption, we would have had 67,000 years worth of biomass uh, of available. Uh, this was the, the plague uh, right in here when there's, the consumption went down, obviously. Uh, zooming in to the year 2000, um, it, with each passing year, the number of years of, of available carbon left diminishes. Now, the reason I'm just kind of scratching my head right now about the 80 that I just came up with is I thought I was going to come up with something closer to 1,000. So, again, I um, apologize for my math not coming out right on the fly, but, you know, that's what research is about. So that, that's, that's kind of the big picture for, for a lot of it, is, is how do you take this, um, how do you take this curve? And you, you could even say, gosh, you know, what, coal and oil are very valuable in very ways, and, you know, why aren't we doing a better job at, at preserving them? You can, you can flip the argument that way, because you know, we're not turning those pumps off overnight, so why, you know, why don't we do a better job at preserving those very valuable resources? So that's kind of how I've been looking at it. That's There's no overriding plan. I, I agree, there is no overriding plan. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, uh, well, there are several plans. You know, you've kind of got your drill baby drill plan or your dig baby dig plan. That's one of them, but uh, in terms of uh, overall sustainability plan, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are people that have, that have come up with them, and I'm just kind of working my own little sphere here, as you can see, on, on multiple fronts. And so, yeah, I guess I don't have one either. I'm just kind of, fo you know, following my... Well, um, I, I, during my talk yesterday, I, I, I showed the one slide on the solutions project, and that showed, you know, what, what renewable energy portfolios would look like for each state in the union um, if we were to go to 100% renewables. So I, I, there are people working on it, I, and, and it's just a matter of, you know, what will be adopted by our leaders and, and legislators, really. So, book, yeah. The book Reinventing Fire. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I. 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 We can do it. Right. Right. I'm a political well man. Absolutely. <laughs> Colorado said uh, 30 percent by 2020. It's legislative. Oh really? Yeah. Absolutely. So okay. So there. There you go. Yeah. That's a stated goal. That is a legislative goal. That's correct. I think there's two states. Could be, yeah. Yeah, lots of people are talking about it. Aspen, Colorado is 100%. I think it's also that also includes like churches. Is 100% renewable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like just a new version or net zero? Probably a lot more. Well, it, it does. It is a Um Yeah, absolutely. No, it's 100% in terms of electricity. Yeah, a Amy Lovins is, is a good thought leader on that. And in fact, um, he, he does a great job tying in the, the physics with the, with the finances. Uh, he, he really does, yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are people with, with plans out there. It's just a matter of Im implementing them. And, you know, like you said, having the political will and, and passing the laws to make it happen. You know, I, and what I found, there really are very few technological barriers anymore. In fact, I'll get back into some of the projects I've been working on, and I'll, I'll just let you know something that uh, happened to me recently that I was somewhat surprised by, but perhaps in retrospect not so much. So um, the island of Antigua has a population about the size of Missoula, 65,000 people or so. Um, there they pay a dollar twenty-five per kilowatt hour for electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, in Montana's 10 or 11 cents. 
um, 100% of their electric, well, I think, I think there might be three kilowatts of PV on the island. Uh, my brother was just down there, and I asked him to do a little bit of researching for me. He says, well, there's some, um, there's some solar thermal on the roofs, but virtually no photovoltaic panels. So we uh, submitted a, I, I did an um, energy analysis for the island, um, did a, uh, put a budget together, submitted a proposal, and um, anyway, what, what, what it turns out, at a dollar twenty-five per kilowatt hour, at five dollars per watt, you you can make for a one megawatt system, you're going to make twenty million dollars of electricity in one year. So you invest five million dollars at five bucks a watt, your payback is three months. <laughs> it's a three or four month payback. And so we submitted that because the premier was requesting uh, re proposals. Uh, a week or two later, we heard back, oh, no, sorry, that won't work. You know, it's, uh, you know, too, too hard. You know, a coconut's going to hit one of the panels and take the whole system out. Well, as it turns out, um, it's, it's purely political. There, there, are no, um, there are no technological barriers. I mean, Hawaii is doing it. There are other islands that are doing it. And it just so happens that there's a um, Syrian strongman who owns the grid on the island of Antigua and happens to own all of the uh, diesel shipping lanes that are coming out of the Middle East. So it, it's purely political. There, there, there really no, um, you know, especially something that small, there, there, there are no technological barriers. It's purely political. Thank you so back to political barriers. Yeah. <laughs> Why did the city of Missoula, what, like, what explanation did they say, no, we're not going to do that? You know, I, I should I should look into it. I just had the opportunity to um, discuss that problem with Brian von Lossenberg, who's um, one of our city council members, and he said he would just have a word with somebody and, and see. I, and I, I'm not really sure why they, they they thought it was a an injury risk. You know, someone was going to cut themselves in the corner of the panel or do chin ups on it or whatever. But I'm like, you know, there's all kinds of junk around town. That, you know. <laughs> No, the the, the, the that's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah no, and, and the where we where we proposed the panel, it was you know far enough below the railing you couldn't reach it, and far enough above the um, the ground that you couldn't reach it either. So I, it, I, I there was there was not a strong argument against it. So I spent a lot of time. Yes. You cited Ilya Oh, I did. Yeah. Yeah, Ilya Prigogine is, yeah. And uh, uh, what, what of his did you say? Okay, so, so Prigogine, if I'm not mistaken, won either the Nobel Prize or something equivalent. And the, the papers that he wrote, as it turns out, were actually written um, with funding from the, I, I believe, the U.S. Department of Energy, if I'm not mistaken. And if, if, if in, in several of the papers he wrote, he, I think they were actually looking, so he's more or less a chemist and looking at um, the ability to extract energy more or less from fossil fuels. And some of the other things he went into were uh, Poincare's conjectures and this whole field of what's called subdynamics, uh, sort of um, look, looking at how you might look at the second law sort of from a um, Carnot um, scale versus a uh, Boltzmann scale. So there's a lot of math in there. I wish I had time to dig, dig deeper into it, but when I was giving a talk in Malaysia to the Wessex Institute in December, uh, Prigogine's work came up severally, several times in relation to some of the, the ideas I was kicking around. So I guess I've been loosely inspired by his ideas in the same way that I was inspired by um, Richard Feynman when he started trying to tie together um, Shannon's information theory and Carnot's and Clausius's theory of the thermodynamics. So that's kind of a broad stroke reference to him. I'd love to learn more about it. Yeah, yeah. he did, um, I don't know, like the, the fractals maybe in chaos complexity theory and things like that, and I wonder if there's a tie to the thermodynamics. But anyway, I just thought it was yeah, I, I, mean, I, I want to. I want to say yes. I'm not exactly sure how. I mean, it could. It could have something to do with you know. It, and it was very new to me when I read it for the first time last year. But this notion of of subdynamics, you know, things that you know, like in our world right now, you think of dynamics in terms of like a baseball flying through the air. 
in subdynamics, you might think more of what um, neutrons are doing bouncing around inside a, a nuclear reactor or what's happening with individual gas molecules at, at the molecular scale. So, so is it a little bit tied to artificial intelligence where you have like individual automatons that behave by certain rules and regulations that are kind of like mm. collaborate together to make larger structures of behavior? Anyway. That, that very well could be, yeah. It's, um, that's a great question. I, I, I don't know the answer to it, but, okay. but it's that, that body of work kind of speaks to that, so it's very interesting. So, I mean, in the, in the application to all of this, is, mm -hmm. I mean, there's the sort of legislative top down, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. thou shalt do this, that, and the next thing, right. which we need for sure, but then there's also each and every one of us have an individual set of things like oh. what we do, yep. and so our collective behavior, like larger structures come out of that. Oh, I like that, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, totally interesting stuff. And, um, what's cool, too, is uh, um, Michael Smith, is the one that did the aqua culture, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he is a physicist and programmed um, the different components of that aquaculture system to interact with each other. Right. So, I mean, that's also an artificial intelligence. So it's just kind of interesting that that's coming up. Yeah, yeah. I like, it, it, there's maybe a little bit of biomimicry thrown in there, if you will, would you, would right, you right. say? Right, yeah. One of the things that when they just played around with these really simple rules for just like little pixels on a screen, they noticed um, you could get like flocking bird behavior. So, I mean, just the natural order that arises spontaneously in nature mm -hmm. can be simulated by giving each pixel or bird or individual unit kind of a simple set of rules right. um, to follow and then this larger behavior that you might not always be able to predict. Right. It, it, there's similar uh, ideas flowing around in economics. I was just speaking with um, Gary Gannon earlier today about uh, Beinhocker's origin of wealth, and he takes sort of a Darwinian evolutionary uh, automata um, view of economics, you know, rather than the sort of top-down dictated, you know, sort of let, let each player take on his or her own traits and see how the, the uh, system evolves. So, yeah, there's, there's some overlap there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Good question. Um, IE recycling is is another one. Um, I'm on this. I'm in this so-called zero waste bucket in uh, Missoula, and so we we recently uh, sent this offer out. Uh, Martin No Runner and I have been collaborating for a couple of years now, and um, really looking at a way to just uh, take the city of Missoula off the landfill in, entirely. You know, a lot of people are just really fed up with it. They don't, you know, trust. Um, at least the practices um, with Republic in Missoula. I know that Republic is one of the world's largest recyclers, but right now they just don't really have the, 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 the person power and the infrastructure to do it in a, in a proper way. So he and I have come up with um, ways to sort of triage the materials. And, and unfortunately, it kind of has to start a little bit messy, you know, it, until you sort of get the single stream, the facilities in place. Um, it, it's a little more challenging, but we're, we're, we're pushing forward on this uh, with, with home resource and, um, you know, Goodwill is there in town and Free Cycle and Pacific Recycling, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, just today I sent him a message trying to figure out, well, gosh, you know, Martin, is your, is your price structure too expensive? And he's looking at like 600 bucks a year. I think curbside is closer to um, 300 to maybe $350 per year. Um, the University of Montana itself spends $400,000 a year on landfill, spends $120K per year on its recycling center. So economically, you'd say, well, just get rid of the recycling center because they take all the stuff anyway. But if you just, you know, flip the waste pancake, if you will, and say, sorry, no more landfill, then you take all those materials and sell them and use them for their embodied energy and their manufacturing uh, utility or their composting. And again, it gets back to that sort of burn, bury, or build decision that you make with every one of these things. Do you, do you put the organics back in the ground? Do you take the woody biomass and turn it into energy? Do you take your styrofoam and turn it in, into insulation? It's, it's going to be one of those three things rather than putting a big old sloppy mess in the interstate or whatever. <laughs> um, so that's another one. We have 13 more minutes left. Is that about right, Carl? Uh, yeah. Okay. 
I'm still on your question, by the way. I'm going through the different projects. International biomass is another one. Uh, so Patrick Brown has a um, uh, licensed and patented technology for taking um, one one pound of thin film plastics, so all the you know nasty bags and all the HDPE, LDP wrapping, every little you know all these wrappers that go everywhere. Um, one pound of that, nine pounds of the woody biomass, he turns it into this industrial-sized pellet that you can ship and it's just like you would with coal. And again, you're like, well, cho choose your poison, but that's what, um, that's what um, Patrick and I have been working on. Also, a little project at um, St. Pat's Hospital to take uh, some of their medical waste and recover some of the heat from it rather than landfilling it. So that's, that's Patrick. Um, we have another, another project that just um, popped up that we're looking to in the, um, in the Philippines. Uh, I guess apparently only 4% of Filipinos are on the uh, sewer. Maybe another 10, 15% have septic and everyone else is just kind of off, off in the wild. And I, I, so they're looking at a way for more um, sustainable ways to, to deal with wastewater and, and, and human waste. And that's just, we're just starting with that a little bit. Uh, Taylor Woods is another entrepreneur, he's a University of Montana graduate, uh, business, uh, business major. He was initially trying to look into the economics of taking biogas, so from the um, water treatment plant, and turning that into methane for energy production. Um, tough, tough, uh, tough call. He's since turned his attention to taking waste CO2 from brewery, you know, the microbreweries in Missoula and returning that CO2 into the, into the production. So a lot of microbreweries will buy maybe a quarter million dollars worth of CO2 per year and then exhaust somewhere on the order of $100,000 worth. So if you could come up with a technology for you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars that captures that, puts it back in, the payback becomes very, very fast. So just, you know, not releasing that CO2 back into the atmosphere. Well, yeah, I, I wish I knew more about the, the technology. I'm not, I'm, fortunately, I'm not the, the strongest chemist, um, and, it, and sometimes it ends up just being a, a scaling problem. It could have been that the, um, uh, and, and I know there are, like, for, for example, there's a, there's a the landfill, and I believe it's Whitefish does take some of their methane and turn it into electricity, but for whatever reason, the size of the wastewater treatment plant in Missoula was not amenable, to, you know, for the the capital investment to put the infrastructure in place for the payback just wasn't something that a uh, traditional bank was willing to was willing to pay for. Um, and then um, there's there's another one here. Uh, I've had a gentleman in uh, in the in the Midwest approach me with a plan for um, building uh, small scale wind turbines in Montana. So we're trying to pull together the manufacturing sectors and see if we can't get him here. He um, was working for the underwriters lab uh, for many years, so has a lot of experience there. And I'm just sitting down with um, um, Jeremy Wolf, who's uh, out of uh, MSU Bozeman and helps coordinate manufacturing uh, around the state of Montana. So ho hoping to get people like that in the state with the expertise and the passion to do some manufacturing. So that's this U.S. Way company, and then this is this is what I'm just working on at the at the university. Um, we the, the University of Montana has this thing they call the Crelf project. So it's the Kles Revolving Energy Loan Fund. And I'm sorry, I wish I was able to navigate uh, quicker and, and get to some of those sites, but we're um, Actually, let me see if I can let me see if I can find that flyer really quick. 2015 uh, grants Carson or some figures. So 
so it would be a uh, approximately a 50 kilowatt PV array on the roof of our west campus. So it's sitting right out there on the edge of town, great open space, and um, he was able to get a little bit of funding for it. And right now we're trying to raise the um, the rest of the capital to implement a, a 50 kilowatt array on uh, west campus. We've also we're also looking at. Uh, behind the meter three megawatt array at the university, but getting for some some reason I still am not really sure about getting a lot of resistance from uh, from our administrators on on main campus and our facilities guys. You know, like ah, it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to cut down trees to do it, which you know frequently, unfortunately, is the case. Uh, there's always a little bit of a competition there, but it would be um, be over a parking lot. You know, it, it would provide shade in the same way that, that trees would provide shade and they were worried that someone was going to have to get up there and brush the snow off of it, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not sure if it's a, um, there's you know, some speculation that uh, the, the president is worried about losing um, funding from eastern Montana, you know, because the, you know, the university system itself is, is, is state funded and a lot of that funding comes, you know, comes from the conventional energy uh, suppliers. So I, I hope that's not the case. I don't think that's the case, but there's been you know, some speculation that, that that might be why, that if we put up too much solar, we're <laughs> lose, our, lose some of our, our funding from some of the larger revenue streams in the state. I don't know. Yeah. So I think, did I answer your question, Carl? I think I got that. <laughs> okay. So those, those are some of the other, other projects. Um, and, I, and I hope I also answered the question regarding sort of the big, big picture of my talk there. Yeah. Okay. Super. Then we can we can talk pregazine offline too. That'd be fun. I'd like to learn more about that. Oh yeah, um, just a great oracle. Um, yeah. Order out of chaos was a book. Um, the end of uncertainty. Yeah. From being to becoming yeah, advances in uh, chemical physics. Yeah. We did get a Nobel Prize. There we go. Nobel Prize. Good. Yep. Um, Nobel Prize. Work on dis dissipative structures, complex systems, and irreversibility. Irreversibility, yeah, yeah. That's, the that's a good one. Reason. Yeah, and and I think that's when when I gave those numbers yesterday in my talk regarding the um, anthropogenic entropy production level, you know, being uh, 23 orders of magnitude greater than the universal background rate. That's that was something that um, was a little mind-blowing to me, you know, if in fact that is reversible. So, yeah, it's a weird one, weird one to think about. <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if you caught that in the talk, but that, that was in this, that yeah, one. that was in, that was in this, um, this last. That was bigger than that. Well, it just means, I don't know, it's the metallic songs that say the greater 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 James Hatfield, I love it. <laughs> yeah, this this was the uh, this is the paper that's just now um, just now coming out. Um. Oh, wow. Do you have um, copies of this? I I could give you a preprint. I think. Oh, okay. uh, so it's not even published. Yet. It's 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 just it's just in uh, it's just in press right now. This is this is the paper that I presented in um, Malaysia, and this is my own little sustainability coefficient. So there's that's information on the left side, and this is entropy on on the right. Um, so yeah, the 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 weird the weird number that came out of it was this. Um, This, this was the weird number that came out that our um, volumetric entropy production rate is, is, is um, what is that, almost a trillion trillion times greater than the universal background entropy production rate just based on our more or less, you know, pump, pumping 500 exajoules of energy into the atmosphere each year. Yeah, it is kind of weird. It, it works out to be right about Avogadro's number, and it's it's also strange that um, 
humans themselves sort of sit at, at about that ratio between the smallest known structures in the universe and the largest known structures. It's, it's a little funny how that, that works out, yeah. In terms of scale, yeah. Yeah, and in terms of the in terms of our own um, atomic complexity, yeah, just the, the total number of particles that make up our corporeal selves. We, we sort of sit at this weird ratio between the very big and the very small. You know, you don't think of it that way, but on a on a logarithmic basis basis, that's about where we are. You know, we're. Could, could be, yeah. We're we're kind of neither here nor there. I don't know. <laughs> Well, um, gosh, thanks everybody. I, I really appreciate you allowing, you know, just allowing me to do a little extra brain dump this afternoon. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.